James Kelly, John Cook, Hal Davis, Peter Easton, and Jean Bart. Do any of these names sound familiar to you? What about these? Mary Reed, William Kidd, Calico Jack, Anne Bonny, and Blackbeard. All of these people were well-known pirates, and they lived during the end of the 17th century. From wooden sailing ships, they ravaged storms across the open seas. These people lived an adventurous life. Do you have an ancestor that may have been on board of a pirate ship? If so, how can you prove it through genealogical research? Hi, this is your friend Carol with another episode of Piedmont Trails. And today we will discuss the records and the history that was left behind the pirates and their crew during the late 17th and early 18th century. The seas were the main trading routes for centuries, and the sea people knew the waters better than anyone. The word pirate originates in Greece, meaning to attack, and was transcribed into Latin, meaning sea robber. By the 16th century, Middle English uh, used the word, but they also used other words to describe pirates such as buccaneer, a freebooter, or a corsair. By the 17th century, the sea people became known worldwide as with the term using pirates. So let's discover the records and the history that are available today, and we'll get started right after this short break. Journey back in time with Piedmont Trails. We embrace the past and we share our discoveries with you. Since 2017, our primary focus has been on colonial records, early settlements, colonial life, and migration paths. Follow along with all of our current projects and visit our attic family files by visiting PiedmontTrails.com. Add adventure to your genealogy research and enjoy your journey today to the past. Welcome back everyone and thank you so much for joining me today. The topic is pirates, genealogy, and history. And my goal today is to leave you with a new direction that hopefully may guide you to the records and to the evidence of real pirates. Today when someone mentions the word pirate, we automatically identify this with a person sailing the ocean that attacks other ships and confiscates the cargo. In reality, the story of pirates is just much more complex. And I hope to share the facts with you today that just may change your opinion about pirates. This is episode number 46 entitled, Pirates, Genealogy, and History. If you suspect that you have an ancestor that may have been a crew member on a pirate ship, you begin to question to yourself, how am I going to find these records? There are all types of records and, and different types of resources that can be used to determine genealogy and history of pirates. Many associate pirates' records as non voyant or there's not many around, but there are. There are all different types. One of the best resources will be personal correspondence, such as letters and journals. And I'm going to share a portion of one of the journals uh, about burials for crew members later on in the show. Another type of record is trading records. And what do I mean by trading records? These are records that consist of merchant trade records, or another description that can be used to describe them is port books. I have found these records dating back to the 16th century. Port books were actually in use um, up until around 1750. And the Board of Customs introduced new registers in 1696 during the increase of piracy on the Atlantic Ocean. These registers are available online in accordance to the year. And they are located at the National Archives. National Archives. So when we just talk about uh, port books, many were written, the original ones, uh, written in Latin, 
prior to 1660. But now after 1660, English becomes the main language in these records. So what type of information would you find in trading records such as port books? What, and also, who were the individuals who recorded the records or the entries in these documents? They were known as the surveyor, the searcher, the controller, and the collector. So what were these roles of these individuals? The collector recorded all goods that were exported or imported and all monies that were received. He all, they would also document it by a type of a receipt and an entry in the book. A controller would make a similar record, but they would not receive the actual payments. It was the collector who oversaw all the funds. The searcher would be appointed to prevent fraud uh, that person would examine the goods, and they would also create a warrant to show that they have completed their job and done so. The surveyor would have been a proofreader, and they would have gone back over what the searcher had entered and make sure that it was correct. In port books, information that you would find would be the name of the ship, uh, its tonnage, uh, the master of the ship, the owner of the ship. Um, it would also list in particular dates with the ship's destinations, um, the ship's port of registry, and its port of departure. It would also contain the names of the merchants that was involved with the ship. And it would go into great detail about the description of goods. Documentation also from the Royal Navy contains a vast amount of information. We've used this often in determining crew members of certain ships. And also, if you pay attention to the sick and hurt board from the Royal Navy archives, you will, um, you will find links that show many of the Royal Navy men who left the Royal Navy and joined the pirates. You will find their names associated in there. We've linked many that way. The Sick and Hurt Board, which, I, which was actually established in 1653. You know, um, men who served with the Royal Navy often faced um, harsh conditions. Uh, many were abused, uh, mistreated, and they would find other ways to make a living and, and leave the Navy. And many of them did join pirates and became occupied in piracy. England's Privy Council documents established in the early 17th century is another uh, good resource. These records um, pertain to the English settlements that were forming in America. So that's the England's Privy Council documents. It's a great resource. Another source would be various news, articles, publications that were active during this particular time period. Some of our favorites who that have gone into great detail about piracy is from London, the Daily Current from 1702 to 1735, the English Post from 1700 to 1708, the Examiner from 1710 to 1714, and one of our favorites, the Flying Post from 1695 to 1733. Another source which is very, very valuable are the actual colonial court records. In 1699, ports uh, located in New York and Massachusetts Bay and Pennsylvania all issued proclamations concerning piracy. These related directly with King James and his proclamation that dated 1688. This period actually was the beginning of the end for the pirates during that time. And by 1730, pirates were the minority and their numbers continued to decrease throughout the 18th century. So what do I mean when they were the minority? Well, years leading up to 1730, pirates outnumbered the British Royal Navy. They were hard to control, and they were becoming a real threat to the British Great Britain. So exactly who were these pirates, and how did they unite to outnumber the British Royal Navy? And did the Republic of Pirates really exist? And what can we learn from the past that may change our view about pirates today? I just want to give you a little brief history of um, 
a couple of individuals here that may that in, in our opinion it really portrays the both sides of the story when it comes to pirates you know great britain contracted men and vessels to secure their investments in the new world and these ships and the crew sailed under a british flag and they were equipped with immunity and they were equipped with legal documents explaining their presence and their activity and they did this for decades they sought ships from france spain and other nations that presented a um, particular threat to British interest. All of the 17th century British settlements along the eastern seashore of the United States today supported and welcomed the pirates. This was due to their communications with England and their protection from France and Spain. Pirates became partners with the leaders of these 17th century settlements. In fact, the pirates were deemed as heroes because of their worthy attacks on the open seas. England was in almost constant battle with Spain from 1585 to 1714. With the death of Charles II attributing to the latter, which was the War of the Spanish Secession. But pirates carried out criminal acts. And they, but they were changed, they were kind of pretty much labeled as a privateer versus a pirate. Um, as a privateer, their actions would be legal and they would be upheld by the British monarchy. As a pirate, it would be the opposite. This action provided a wealth, a ton of wealth and riches to Great Britain. And now, over time, was beginning to gain strength and with Great Britain's main priority goal as a world power, a recognized world power, the pirates, our privateers, greatly uh, influenced this. Francis Drake, a privateer slash pirate, empowered by Queen Elizabeth I, changed history by plundering Spanish treasures and more. When we take a closer look, um, I want to share the story of Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan was born in Wales, uh, circa 1635, and he becomes part of a group attacking Spanish vessels during the Anglo-Spanish War in the 1660 time period. Morgan becomes close friends with Sir Thomas Modiford, who is at the actual governor of Jamaica. In 1667, Montefort gives Morgan a letter of Marquis, which is an actual license to attack and seize Spanish ships. In July 1670, King Charles II signed a peace treaty with Spain. Now, during this time period, Morgan was continuing his raids and attacks, and he even attacks Panama City in 1671. Now, of course, King Charles II becomes very upset over this because he's just recently signed this peace treaty um, with Spain. Sir Thomas Montefort and uh, Henry Morgan are both arrested, and they are transported to London. So what happened to these two men? Well, Montefort was never brought to trial, but he does spend two years in the Tower of London. He was released in 1674, and by the summer of 1675, he is back on his plantation in Jamaica. As to Morgan, he was never brought to trial, and he never spent time in the Tower of London. Instead, he was greeted and proclaimed as a hero. In fact, Morgan was appointed the title of Knight Bachelor, and he returned to Jamaica by January of 1675. Morgan went on to serve as Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica and as a member of the Assembly as well. Both men prospered greatly and they were very wealthy at the time of their death. Morgan's estate consisted of three total plantations, a number of three, and they were estimated at a worth of 5,600 pounds at the time of his death. Today, that estate would be well worth over $2 million. It's not too bad for 30 years of piracy in the Caribbean. This is a prime example of how 
Pirates were surrounded by government officials, political figures, and protected by the British monarchy. During this time period, they sailed under their nation's flag and they were protected, just as they protected their nation's history, I mean, not nation's interest. They were, protect, they were protected and then they protected the nation's interest, namely Great Britain. Morgan was buried at Port Royal, the wealthiest port in the world. Port Royal was located in southeastern Jamaica, and pirates from all over the world would visit this area. Ironically, a huge earthquake hit the area in 1692, and it actually wiped out approximately one-third of the land mass. The actual grave of Henry Morgan slid into the sea and was lost forever. To give you an example of how popular um, Port Royal was, over 10,000 people lived in the area during this time period, and the community had over 2,000 buildings situated on approximately 50 to 60 acres of land. There were over 50 taverns that lined the streets providing rum and entertainment 24 hours a day. Port Royal has a vast amount of records and artifacts pertaining to piracy. Many of these documents have never been transcribed, they've never been documented, and they've never been thoroughly researched. So, if you do plan on plan taking a trip to Port Royal, let me know. I would love to know that because I would love to know exactly what all are the... Um, what all types of records that they do have there. So when did the pirates become a problem for Britain's interest? Well, the answer is when the pirates outnumbered the Royal Navy, they quickly became much more difficult to control. It was really the, you know, it was a prosperous employment to be, not, to be a pirate or a slash privateer. Because you would, during raids and attacks and battles on the open seas, the, um, these treasures and cargo that they confiscated would be shared among the men, on, uh, crew members on the ship. So over time, they grew so much that they could not be controlled. Instead of pirates concentrating on France and Spain, which was originally the idea, Great Britain's idea, they began also concentrating on any cargo that was worth the effort to take over a ship. Another factor to consider is the end of the Spanish secession in 1713. When that war ended, uh, the Royal Navy was actually bankrupt because they had provided 12 years of funding against the wars against Spain. They were bankrupt, and the pirates were all of a sudden out of a job. They were no longer needed. And Port Royal began to fill up with angry men and women. Yes, women were pirates too. So Port Royal began to fill up with angry men and women that didn't have a ship, and they no longer had employment. Benjamin Hornigold and Edward Thatch, or Edward Teach, were among the first men who transformed into the pirates that we think of today. Nassau, along the Caribbean islands, became their base station, and over the next several years, they built their forces up and united with one another against all ships carrying any type of treasured cargo. It came to the point to where King George felt that he needed to just offer a pardon to all of these pirates, and he did that in 1717. But he also ordered all pirates were to surrender in accordance to this pardon by July 1st, 1719. A great portion of these men and women did take advantage of that pardon, but the ones that remained all of a sudden, overnight, became the hunted instead of the privateers hunting cargo. They also became hunted. The real history about pirates allures us into a very mysterious world. But the records they left behind are amazing, and they are just waiting for all of you to discover them. 
The paper trail is endless, and they consist of personal correspondence, court records, trading records, ship log books, journals, colonial council of trade documents, notes from the Royal Navy, news articles, and various other publications. Port Royal has a great amount of records about individuals, certain individuals, crew members, captains. A lesser known fact is that the colonies all developed a relationship with pirates. So you will also find colonial records in all of the British colonies pertaining to that. These range from protection to arranging shipments for particular items to even transporting individuals back and forth from the New World to the Old. A pirate was held up as a hero up until 1713. This was when the society, the colonial society, shifted and pirates became known as thieves, kidnappers, criminals, outlaws, and much worse. For those who accepted King George's pardon, life changed for those women and men who stuck to their oath. But for those who refused it, they became wanted criminals and almost all of them were captured or killed. Many of these, turn, many of the former pirates turned on their friends. Benjamin Hornigold is just a prime example of this. He was once a good, very good friend to Blackbeard, Edward Teach. Um, in fact, records and documents prove that Benjamin Hornigold took um, Edward Teach under his wing and taught him everything that he knew. Well, he act Hornigold turned on Blackbeard and even assisted in Blackbeard's capture or leading up to it. Those that were captured and hung for their crimes often received no burial. Um, so you can see how much society has shifted from pro being proclaimed as heroes to now you don't even deserve to be buried when, when you die. So instead, their bodies were allowed to be displayed for all to see. They would often, oftentimes, uh, when they were hung, then they would take the body down. Um, sometimes they would chain the body up on the seashore, and they would leave it there. Uh, other times they would behead the person, and then the head would be uh, placed on a stake, and it would be left there. It would be there to remind pirates on the seas to remind them of what will happen to you if you continue this behavior. So the largest group of pirates given a burial, an actual burial, took place at Goat Island in Newport County, Rhode Island. Twenty-six pirates were hung and they were buried that same day of July 19, 1723. When you get into journals, and there's all types of different journals and diaries and letters that associate uh, with pirates, many times um, some people think, well, the crew members didn't know how to write or they wouldn't take the the, the time to sit and write, but you, there are many, many journals and letters from crew members of pirate ships that exist today. Um, the Journal of Edward Barlow is a prime example of that. And he actually goes into detail and gives us clues about burials for pirates while they're on the open sea. And he, his journal states in his own words, he says, respected crew members and captains were more likely to receive a burial on land. I think it varied from individual to individual um, and circumstances too. I wanted to also share with you a few things. Here we go. I wanted to share a few pirates that are known to um, have originated from the British colonies because there were many. But I'm just going to give an example of those, some of them. That's Thomas Tew from Rhode Island, Evan Jones from New York, Frederick Phillips out of New York, Captain Veal from Massachusetts, and Thomas Griffin. You know, pirates were from all types of regions of the world, and they comprised of all nationalities. Servants and slaves would be free on a pirate ship if they joined the Pirates' Republic. There were, as an oath, they had to take an oath to join, but once they did, former slaves and former indentured servants would be respected crew members and even captains on a pirate ship. 
some very important um, acts that were passed, 1700 Piracy Act, where local citizens no longer served on the jury, the 1713 Treaty of Utrecht, uh, ended the war between England, Spain, and France. And it's also important to recognize that each individual colony made the decision to abandon dealings made with pirates. Um, and that was it, that developed over time. So they they all eventually were against the pirates. But at first they they just took the some of them took their sweet time in making that decision. By 1718, the Board of Trade in England voiced this very clearly. The pirates received a large majority of support from the local people, and they often protected them. If you study the trials and the actual execution sites, you will discover a lot more details about the lives of some of these many pirates. Some execution uh, locations are Execution Dock in London, uh, Gallows Point in Jamaica, Charles River in Boston, and White Point in Charleston. In 1717 to 1718, you had the Acts of Grace, which was the actual pardon issued by the king to the pirates. And many people aren't aware that Blackbeard was pardoned in Bath, North Carolina, on June, in June 1718. Um, he did this, I think, for several reasons, but Blackbeard knew of his friend Steve Bonnet's uh, pardon, which he had accepted in May of 1718. Even though both of these men were received the oath and took the oath and swore uh, on the pardon and accepted it, they both returned to piracy. And another important note is that if you study the trials and the colonial records, you will see that a lot of the pirates during their trials, that were, as, they, as their trial was ongoing, they testified against corrupted government leaders during that time. Um... A lot of interesting things come out when you really start to begin to research those trials. And I'm just going to name a few um, highlighted trials that you can actually find online. The arraignment trial and condemnation of Captain John Quelch in Boston. The trial of George North and his crew in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, the trials of Major Steve Bonnet. And that was also in Charleston, South Carolina. Let me give you the date, 1718 for that one. The one for Francis de Mont was 1717. And um, for George North was 1716. Another interesting one is the trial of Nicholas Simmons, dated 1724 in Rhode Island. And the last one I'll share is Lieutenant Richardson uh, from 1738 in New York. The Republic of Pirates did exist, and they had a code that they lived by. And evidence points to George Cusack, uh, Cusack in 1668, who documented the actual pirate codes. Each crew member was asked to make his mark and swear an oath to the codes. Items used um, for taking the oath were, there was Bibles used, sometimes there were swords, pistols, and at times even a human skull was used to take the oath. When a ship was captured, portions of the captured crew would sometimes voluntarily join into the pirate ship, and sometimes they were forced to join the pirate's crew. They would be subject to the um, code as well. Sometimes they were forced to take the code, uh, and others volunteered to do it. If you also look at the articles of Bartholomew Roberts, that's Bartholomew Roberts, you'll have a clear understanding about the Republic of Pirates and how their code of honor operated. All right, we're going to, let's wrap up the show with some final comments, and we'll do that right after this short break. If you've enjoyed the show, let us know about it. Here at Piedmont Trails, we love researching the past. The only thing that is better is sharing it with all of you. Now let's get back to the show. I hope the show has brought you to a new understanding about pirates' records and where you can find them. As with any group or society, you have good players and you have bad players. 
And this is also true with pirates. Men who formerly joined the Royal Navy were often mistreated and they suffered harsh conditions, very harsh conditions. And this led many of them to join pirates and their ships. British leaders in the colonies paid pirates to attack ships with Spain, France, well, actually anyone was a game. And you may not know this, but the Continental Congress actually hired 55,000 pirates to oppose the British during the American Revolutionary War. You can look this up in the Continental Congress records dated April 3rd, 1776. Today, pirates are separated as a group, and we think of them sailing the seas with their flags, their skull flags flying in the wind, and their cannons ready for battle and keeping their eyes on the horizon for that next victim. But I think the men and women who were known as pirates were much more than this. So we dare you to discover the past, my friends, and enjoy your journey. Thank you so much for listening to the show, and God bless.